All right, so this is our class portal. And remember, if we go to content, student items, and where's the housekeeping? There it is. And here's the course plan that we, we are following. All right. And let's see here. Theory schedule. Look, April 7 is Good Friday, so that means there is no school, just so we have that date written down. And well, it is written down already. But that is week 13, which is the next week after this one. We are now on uh, Friday of week 12. This is March 31st today, Friday. All right. So look at this here. Week 13 is an open lab. Just keep in mind that Friday is a good Friday. So there is no school. So if you have any labs that uh, need to be addressed that you haven't done for whatever reason, this will be the week of open lab week to tie all the loose ends. Just keep in mind that Friday there is no school. Okay. All right, so we got that out of the way. switch screens when I switch screens funny things are happening sometimes okay so this is this was the last slide that we have um, we have looked at uh, during our last uh, in-person class all right so this is the second part of the second group uh, <clears throat> couple of days ago I did the same presentations uh, for the first group so anyways you can you will be able to find this whole thing on YouTube all right so the last slide was uh, remember we were talking about the stages of work what we can uh, uh, what we can expect to encounter when we find ourselves a job in this field and uh, what kind of branches we could uh, follow uh, because sometimes um, we uh, we don't stay doing the same thing uh, you might start as a field worker and then you may notice that you like something about uh, managing projects so maybe you want to take your career that way uh, when the years go by, you never know what is going to appeal to you and when. So uh, we talked about survey, assessment, site work, commissioning, and billing. All right, so that was the first part during the week in person. Now we're going to analyze uh, some um, aspects of finding ourselves uh, at the work site. How things? How is it that things are organized? Uh, so, uh, just how is it that things are organized uh, in order to accomplish the jobs uh, properly, efficiently, and of course, safely, all right? So, okay, so site work. We're going to install all kinds of equipment, uh, make it work, um, and uh, maybe do some service uh, that has to do with that. Right? Because equipment does break down, we do live in the real world, and that's what happens in the real world. Um, okay, so when it comes to installation, first, uh, we're going to, well, we went all through the whole planning stages. Once it's all said and done as far as planning, you're going to have to uh, roll up your sleeves and actually do uh, what needs to be done. So first thing, what would after you have planned all your all your things, of course, first thing would be that you would assemble the raceway, and uh, we're going to interweave between this and um, and some other aspects. But after the raceway is assembled, 
the rough end begins. And I put this thing as a first item because sometimes the, well, the process of assembling the raceway is more involved and sometimes not as much as other times, okay? <coughs> so rough end is kind of sometimes interweaved with, um, with assembling some of the raceway. You will see what I mean as we go along. All right. So let's say, let's see here. Let's see what I wrote. <laughs> All right. After planning uh, the cable distribution, the rough in stage begins. Roughing in. What does it mean? It means that all cables are pulled from the home run location. And usually this would be something like a LAN room. Uh, so all cables are pulled from the home run location to their destinations. And that could be anywhere, desktop, ceiling, walls, floor, modular furniture, whatever. So that would be the local destinations, their, their destinations, cables, destinations. The cables are coiled in bundles at both ends, but not terminated. That's the idea of roughing in. Again, the cables are coiled in bundles at both ends, but not they're not terminated. So here, so let's say there's a bunch of offices that need to be done. Now, the rough in, in this case, uh, you might want to decide whether if, uh, if you're going to do, let's say, one, two, three offices from here to here, or maybe these two offices have so many jacks, and you're going to decide that this will be the common branch branching off point. Now, for the rough in, you could just coil all the wires right here and then come back to them when it comes to terminating, or you can bring them to ab above the locations that they need to be. So it's you're going to decide. Uh, which way to take uh, right on the spot there. Eh? That depends on many things. All right, notice one thing that I put here. There is a little device here. It's a device in the form of, like, well, in this case, will be inverted J, but if you go the other way, it's going to be, you know, no, that isn't J. <laughs> uh, so, this one is called a J hook, all right? And we'll talk about those uh, in the next couple of slides. Now, when it comes to running the wire, usually um, the roughing in or any kind of wire pulling uh, duties should be done with at least two people, all right? So here's the calculation rough calculation if it takes you 10 hours to do the wire pulling for a certain facility while you have two people working at it let's say you have two people working at the wire pulling and the job takes 10 hours you eliminate one person the job does not extend to 20 hours it extends to 30 hours that's that's how it works. Okay. So uh, in this case, you could do this thing with two people. One person kind of un undoes those wires because those this okay. So these wires are mounted. These wires are on reels. So you would have those horizontal pipes threaded, uh, and this would be threaded horizontally. And those so those uh, so those reels kind of turn and unwind the wire as you go along. You're not going to have them on the floor and try to unwind it. That's That would be just not very time efficient. Plus, those cables would uh, twist on you and you would end up with a whole bunch of kinks. So you would have those something that's called uh, wire racks or wire pulling racks or cable racks. All right, so that, or you could have them in boxes. You just put the boxes on the floor and the cable just pulls out of them. Nevertheless, in both cases, you're going to have someone here just making sure that the cables are coming off the rolls or out of the boxes properly. And there's going to be another person on the other end just feeding that here. All right. Now, you could have a third person pulling the wires at the same time. So you could have three people, one, two, and three. And that was going to cut the time significantly. All right. Um, now, 
you could do it with two people just undo it here pull the slack towards over there and then this person goes over there or that person stays there and this person just keeps pulling here and that person feeds it so that's uh, that's as far as the wire pulling goes all right so um what else is there about the raffin all runs are securely mounted in the ceiling space or otherwise raceways and the work is done according to the local building and electrical code you so just have to make sure that um well we'll talk about uh, what what that means most of it has to do with the type of wire or the type of insulation that needs to be done according to the type of building or the type of interior uh and uh, some of the mounting that uh, the, the way the wires are mounted um okay. So that's pretty much it as far as the extra low voltage wiring because the signal wires uh, or data wires they're considered to be extra low voltage that 110 volts or 120 volts uh, in your outlets to uh, that you plug in your refrigerator to or TV or vacuum cleaner that's called low voltage. Right. All right, so roughing in basically you just pull the wires and you have loose ends at the home run location and you have coiled bundles pretty much pulled to the, to the location but not terminated why is it done why are things being done this way uh, the name of the game is efficiency right? you just arm yourself with one set of tools you perform one set of tasks and you do one kind of a setup then the work significantly goes faster uh, if you wanted to do everything from start to finish, you are going to have to pull those wires there, go and change your tools. Somebody is going to run that thing in the land room, dress it up, and maybe terminate that. And some other you know, or person is going to go and run this thing here. And in the meantime, this whole thing is just standing here. So people walking by it, maybe some cables are going to run on the floors. People are going to step on things. That just would not be efficient and, uh, and a good way of doing things. So do uh, divide those tasks in stages uh, so you can do them faster, quicker, and more efficient, safe, and uh, actually, well, when it comes to people stepping on your wires, um, well, things are not going to get damaged. All right? So here is the rough in stage. Mind you, the rough in stage could be a billable stage to the client. So you could say, as a part of your contract, um, well, upon the equipment delivery, we need to check for so much. Right? And then the next stage would be roughing in. When the roughing in is done, we need another check cut to our company. And then you keep going. Right? There are various, there, there are different reasons. I told you those reasons uh, last time uh, we saw each other in person. Okay. All right. Next uh, thing here, site work, roughing tools, pathways and raceways. Okay. Cable installation begins with establishing pathways. Now, when you run the wires, you're going to have something, uh, so-called free air runs, or we're going to run cables in raceways. Some of the raceways, even though there is a raceway, like for example, a cable tray, the cables are just laying on top of the cable tray. So it's sort of like a free air run uh, when, you, when you consider certain aspects, like, for example, the type of insulation. The cable is still exposed. Uh, the doing J-hooks uh, is considered a completely free, free air. Free air means that the cables are not enclosed in conduits or pipes or, or wireways. Okay? Uh, so... <clears throat> Let's see what I wrote here. The main for, for free air runs, the main runs should be kept in bundles and suspended independently of any ceiling structures. Now let's stop here for a sec. Main runs should be kept in bundles. All right, let's go back to this thing here. If you bundle up the wires, then instead of, because if, if let's say from the land room, you can find some sort of a common point that you can branch them off and um, in order to be the most efficient when you come to uh, when it comes to doing this job so if you bundle those wires and instead of pulling one by one 
uh, if you pull the whole bundle, then you have pulled maybe 12 wires. It's not that uncommon. 15 wires, not that uncommon, depending on what gauge. I wouldn't pull 15 wires of CAT 6A uh, at the same time. But CAT 5E, yeah, 12, 15 wires, it's been done. Not very uncommon. Uh, then, look, instead of doing 15 trips, you're just doing one trip of 15. And then from here, you're branching out. So that's you know, plus you don't have your wires run all over the place. You have them grouped nicely in one place, which means you only from that point to this point, you only need one set of J hooks to establish the raceway. Okay. All right, let's see what else we have here. Main who's coming in models and suspended independently of any ceiling structures. What do I mean by that? So it used to be not that long ago, well, not that long ago to me. Um, I'm talking about 20, 25, maybe 30 years ago. A lot of wiring would be run and people would zip tie those wires to those rods, those metal rods that extend from the top of the true ceiling to the point where the ceiling structure, the ceiling frame for the ceiling tiles, the suspended ceiling frame, is suspended. Those will be those metal rods. That frame, the grid for the ceiling tiles, is suspended on metal rods. So when people would just go and pull the wires inside the ceiling space, they would zip tie those wires to those rods, for example or it could be other structures. The problem with that is, is that, um, God forbid, there's a fire, uh, then, uh, well, the fire crews have to go and uh, do some, whatever the thing that they have to do. And part of the things that they have to do is, um, well, to get to the, to the point where the fire is, or making sure that things are safe, they sometimes bring the ceiling structure down, the suspended ceiling. They have those, I'm not sure what they're called, the hooks on the stick, and they just grab some of the things that hang from the ceiling and just bring it down in order for, uh, you know, to make things safe. So what happens is that if it, the more things are tied to that structure, the more difficult the job becomes and more unpredictable the outcome becomes. So somebody smart got together with somebody else who is also smart uh, and they decided that uh, you know what for that reason maybe all the cabling and all that stuff because before the cabling was not that much of an issue because the networks were not so popular 30 years ago not that long 30 years ago there was not many networks uh, going out going about you could have a whole building without any computer network now uh, it is hard to imagine a commercial facility without um, you know data wiring uh, so there's a lot more wires involved in the ceiling structure than it used to be 30 years ago so um, it was decided that the any of the wiring should have independent suspension in the ceiling so they should be self-supported independent of any other structures and it kind of makes sense kind of it of course it does make sense right so um the cables are called and bundled but not terminated make sure that uh, okay or runs okay uh, we had that already all right um so we have the reasoning why things should be suspended independently of any ceiling structures. And if you don't follow that rule, if you just keep hacking away and uh, coil by, uh, binding your wire to whatever you can find, your job might be re uh, rejected and you might have to pull your wires out and uh, redo the whole thing again, which is no problem if you have one or two wires. But if you have a 600 wire job, then it becomes a problem, a big one. right? 600 wire problem uh, all right so as much as possible establish straight runs so pulling multiple cables can be done efficiently again i'm going to read this again as much as possible establish straight runs so pulling multiple cables can be done efficiently again here here's a straight run how do you establish a straight run 
quite often there's that string you know the string the twine string that you buy in boxes uh, and i'm not sure how many kilometers of that thing is on, on, on in that box but this thing just keeps pulling out so sometimes that is one of your best friends on the job site you take that string and you tie that to one end where you could, when you think that you can establish a straight run. What is he talking about? There is all kinds of straight runs you can establish. Not really. Sometimes when you pop the ceiling tiles or even before the ceiling is installed, there is going to be all kinds of equipment by other brands installed. There could be some air ducts. Those are big. Uh, there could be some other control equipment, this, that, and the other thing. And I think that, you know, security, climate control, blah, blah, blah. And this, sometimes the ceiling fills up pretty quick, pretty quickly. Right? So... Sometimes establishing straight runs uh, takes a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, of, of tweaking. Right? Plus, uh, sometimes you're really going to have to consult the drawings because uh, if you're one of the first ones to, on, the, on, on the job site, uh, then um, you might run your wires in the way of somebody else's uh, space that they have designated uh, for their equipment however by saying that you can look at the drawings all you want you might run into a situation that and if anybody is watching this what i'm saying right now they know exactly what i'm talking about and they're going to have a weird smile on their face um even though sometimes if you're the first one so when is the best when is the best time to pull the wires, to lay those wires, to install the wires? It is before the drywall is installed. It is um, before the ceiling tiles are mounted. And it is after the HVAC or air duct companies are done with their with their work well you may run into the situ into a situation when you might run into a situation is something like this you have the drawings and you see the ceiling space on the drawings and you say okay so we should be safe if we run our wires here from here to here da 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 that's good you mount your j hooks and then there's going to be a bunch of um uh, Mm, other trades that are going to come in while you're not there because okay i have established my j hooks tonight so we were working all, the whole night establishing our j hooks and we strung them tomorrow we're going to pull the wires in those j hooks and the next day you come over and those j hooks are taken off and you see a bunch of air ducts in the space that you were going to use and you're going to go what it just happened we spent all night hanging those so we have to do this thing again choose another way because some of the air duct guys decided that it's going to be better for them if they run the air ducts this way and the other way and here and there right and then uh well what about the drawings oh you wow well, the drawings were wrong okay that, that. so and who go you know so you have lost a whole day or whole night hanging the j-hooks and somebody just came the next day while you're not there and took them off and then uh, you might say yeah okay if that's something like that happens somebody can be sued yeah you know what who are you going to sue and uh, when are they going to do it all right uh, so here's the thing the best way to install the wires is as i said before the drywall is installed because you have the freedom of running the wires in the walls um, before the ceiling tiles are installed in the ceiling grid but that is usually is the last thing that's ever done anyways and one of the most important things after the air duct guys are gone and done their job then you can run your wires because they will come over and they don't understand the importance of the the need of not disturbing the wires and if there's some people watching uh, I can I can see in my eye of imagination uh, that uh, a lot of people are nodding their heads and smiling right now. All right? Um, they will destroy your wires. Love them, 
because you should love everyone, right? <laughs> <laughs> but please try to pull your wires after the air duct guys are gone <laughs> right um so uh here now how do you establish a straight run after the whole shebang is there in the ceiling and the thing is packed you're going to look for some straight lines that you're going from here to here you tie your string to one spot that you can you think that you can establish a straight line and you just run the string the twine from that box along the ceiling da 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 and as, and then over the other end when when you get to the other end you're just going to pull it snug and you go yeah there we go we got a straight line so you mount that string right at that spot here's your pathway along the pathway you just mount the j hooks every four feet no further than four feet apart uh, so the wires don't snag too much and uh, then you're just going to bring that string into the j-hooks so you can mount the wires on one side uh, to the string and you can pull the string on the other side and with one pull you can get all those now you might want to tie something that's called a back string to the wires so you can reuse that uh, pathway if you want to do more pulls but then again keep in mind that you can only do it once or twice because before the whole thing becomes entangled within itself so you might have to establish a new string pathway so it's free of um, being tangled in all, all the wires so establishing straight lines sometimes if you if you do things right and if you mount the j hooks around um, uh, at the right angle with one turn you might get away with pulling a bundle, but you're going to have to mount them a certain way and tie them a certain way to a string. Yes, it's possible to pull the uh, in J-hooks at the right angle. So from here, let's say if you pull the wires from here and around the corner here, and you're going to pull them right here, that's going to be a pulling force. Yes, you can arrange those J-hooks in the ceiling in a way that, uh, that you can pull that. But... Uh, when you're starting out i will just do straight lines uh first right? uh okay all runs securely monitor the ceiling space otherwise race points and da, 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 da. okay so yeah <laughs> all right here we go as much as possible establish straight runs so pulling uh, multiple cables can be done uh, uh done efficiently j hooks mounted on the walls or suspended uh, rods uh, j hooks mounted on the walls or suspended from the ceiling on the threaded rods are the most common in this scenario. Uh, we'll talk about that. Raceways. As the alternative to free air method, closed raceways or cable trays are used. All the raceways should be installed before cable uh, cables are run. Hint. Position the J-hooks no further than four feet apart to avoid sagging. Again, let's go back to this point here. Establish the J-hooks no further than four feet apart if you if you have them um separated further apart then the sagging begins and uh, the problem with the sagging is well first of all it's aesthetics but who cares about the aesthetics after the whole thing is being installed the ceiling being covered nobody sees that anyway right but the problem the real problem is when cables are sagging the the at the point of contact uh, there is just too much pressure when the cable are sagging and that is just like the cable being stepped on or deformed otherwise so that means it can change the specifications of the cable and so cat 6 or cat 6a might not be cat 6a anymore all right um so that's why and sometimes you're going to have this thing written in the contract that the j hooks are no further than four feet apart all right what else uh, is involved in installing some of the wiring, pathways, raceways, and whatnot? <coughs> okay. Uh, threaded rods are a common Lego for grown-ups uh, bits that we're going to use. If when you were kids, you used the Lego to put things together. Now you use the real thing. All right. Uh, you're not a kid anymore. All right. I'm not a kid. Although sometimes, never mind. Uh, so <laughs> um, here's some things that are called threaded rods. And you can go to some hardware stores and see they're all over the place. Uh, what are the threaded rods? A relatively long rod that is threaded at both ends. So you have a thread here or have a thread here. 
So that's if it's an established length rod. Now, the thread might extend along the complete length of the rod. So sometimes, most of the time, you're going to see the thread just all the way through. What do you do? You can cut that to length and use it as you please or as you have to. They come in different gauges, different thicknesses, and you can cut them to length. Uh, when you cut them to length, you can just use a hacksaw right? um, or a grinder, the edge of the grinder. Make sure that uh, you taper the thread properly. Uh, and one of the most com one of those common things, most common things, is that you thread a bolt somewhere further down here, and then you cut it, and then you just unroll the bolt off, and that cleans up the thread. It's one of those, uh, and then you can just use this little file just to taper things off. Uh, those threaded rods can be mounted in the ceiling to hold a whole bunch of things, right? Like, for example, the strut channel. This is here, that thing here. This is a strut channel. Strut channel, all right? Um, strut channel, a standardized formed structural system used in construction and electrical industries for light structural support, often for supporting wiring, plumbing or mechanical components such as air conditioning or ventilation systems that's, those are the guys that we love right we want them to be out before we start our work <laughs> all right uh, so uh, this is what uh, strut channel looks like and then again it is constructed in a way that you can cut this to length and combine that with the threaded rods wow you can do all kinds of things uh, one thing i'm going to point this point to you is watch this link once you, once this presentation is available for you to download which is going to be today uh, so here is the thing how do we mount this how do we use those things together well here's something that's called a spring nut a spring nut is a nut with a spring <laughs> right? um, so uh, what do you do is you, you mount that spring nut so it is kind of latched. Those edges are latched in between those lips of the strut channel. But if they're just laying there, uh, well, you're going to lose them pretty quickly. So that's why the spring is there to kind of press that against that. So they are mount. Just, just look at that video. It's about a minute and a half long video, maybe two minutes out of your life. You're going to be wowed, all right? <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, here's the other picture, and I have a magnification of that because sometimes I do class in person, so uh, I put it, this thing. I put this thing on a bigger projector. Those strut channels come in different variations. This here have slotted channel and the punched channel. These are probably the most common that you might going that you're going to find. Although uh, the electrical supplies or any kind of distributors. Um, they might carry a bunch of sometimes you might pick this thing off the shelf uh, the way it is and sometimes if you need a specific one like a half channel because you are maybe constructed with space uh, then uh, you might have to wait a couple of days before they get it from another branch or so now one thing also one thing there's always one thing I'm pointing you to right uh, this is important right cutting because those that strut channel you can cut to length and you can make all kinds of wonderful constructions um, contraptions with that one thing i'm going to point well, again i say one thing i'm going to point you i gotta stop saying that anyways uh when we cut that rod it is made of galvanized metal when what happens is you could use a hacksaw to cut it, but uh, you're going to look for some other more efficient ways uh, after you do the second cut because you're going to do a lot of sawing with your hands. And if this is a bigger project that you're going to do, uh, there's no way you're going to find some, for some more efficient ways. You're going to look for some more efficient ways. Excuse me. <coughs> All right. So some mechanical chop saws are common and this is a chop saw it's not a miter saw some people confuse miter saws with chop saws and there's sometimes there's misconception that chop saw is the same thing as a miter saw they're very very similar but there is some difference so for this you would probably use a chop saw uh, look what's happening here sparks are flying that means this 
point here has heated as much as it produced the sparks. Okay, so there's a lot of heat there. If you heat the galvanized, if you heat galvanized metal, which probably not mostly going to be steel, fumes are being released. And breeding those fumes is not good. As and as I said on the other presentation, I'm going to repeat that. Breeding those fumes. Seriously, trust me, no good. <coughs> That's right. All right, so just click on that link and familiarize yourself with this article. And it talks about something that's called metal fume fever. You might want to familiarize yourselves with that. So when you're doing that, use a well-ventilated area. And if you have to, sometimes you might have to use, um, well, respirator masks in order to not uh, be affected by the fumes that are being produced by cutting galvanized metal to the point that things are being heat up, heated up. All right. Next thing, J-hooks. J-hooks are also a wonderful thing, and the good thing is that you don't have to cut them. <laughs> you just put them together. All right. J-hooks, they could go, they could be metal, they could be plastic, whichever you, get, you can get your hands on. Um, and they come in with different sizes, one inch hooks, two inch hooks, three, four, and whatnot. Now, they also, they, al they also uh, have specifications on how many wires you can fit on a three inch J hook. Now, what do you mean how many wires? Well, how many wires are cut 5E? How many wires are cut 6? How many wires cut 6A? And so on, because they do have capabilities. Uh, now, see, this is what I mean by sagging. If those J hooks are placed further than four feet apart, then the sagging is becoming really, uh, well, a problematic thing, because that's where the that's where the wires are being pressured here, right here at this point. That would be the pressure point. All right, so. This is how you mount the J-hooks on the wall. They come in a way that you can mount them in the, in the wall. Now, some of them come with the brackets, this kind of brackets. It doesn't, I don't mean that uh, here, it doesn't mean that uh, if it's plastic, they should be mounted in the ceiling, and if it's metal, they should be mounted on the wall. They do come in ceiling or wall configuration, and these also come in ceiling and wall configurations. So um, uh, plastic or metal, well, you decide. Um, sometimes the price is the deciding point. Or availability, period. Plastic or metal, they both do the job well. Uh, now, here's another thing. Threaded rods, remember we talked about them? Combine those with the idea of a J-hook and maybe the idea of a strut or the T-bar construction uh, in the ceiling. Um, you can uh, get different uh, mounting paraphernalia. Whoever sells things that have to do with the installations, and mostly this would be the electrical distributor stores um, and other ways contracting stores, they contractors stores, they would uh, have other things to mount this thing uh, pretty much in stock. Right? So you can mount the threaded rod on the metal construction, the T-bar over there, and then through the threaded rod, you can mount the J-hooks. You can mount the J-hooks on either side of the threaded rod to maximize the space if you have a lot of wires uh, to pull. So that's what the J-hooks look like. All right. uh, <clears throat> J-hooks sometimes, and see here's the example of uh, mounting those J-hooks on both ends. Yeah, you can mount them individually, you can mount them in kind of like Christmas tree configuration <laughs> like that. Make sure that the lowest point is at least, at least six inches uh, on top of the uh, ceiling tiles frame. Otherwise, you might run into, into problems when it comes to the ceiling tiles conflicting with the wires being installed. Sometimes you mount them in a concrete space. Okay. Um, 
how do we mount the threaded rods in the concrete ceiling space? One of the things that we that are being used commonly is uh, threaded here, threaded rod hanger. Okay, it it's like a bolt or screw configuration. Um, it has the bolt gripping point, so you can screw that thing into the ceiling and it has a thread inside so you can mount the threaded rod inside you can twist that in there and there it is you need a hammer drill to do that to do the to drive the hole here to drill the hole uh, now here's the thing this if you look at the specifications on the threaded on the threaded rod hangers you'll be surprised what they're specified for of, in the means of what weight they can handle just go and look at it and you'll be surprised how far this thing can go now by saying that you can have the best in the world threaded rod hanger but if the structure the the material that you're pulling it in if it's not specified to handle that weight then yeah well you're only as strong as the weakest point all right so just keep that in mind also when it comes to drilling holes in the ceiling sometimes you're going to have okay this concrete ceiling so there's half you know you're halfway there just drill the hole in the concrete using a good hammer drill sometimes you have that perforated ceiling so there's a concrete ceiling and it is covered from the bottom with a steel construction that is when you see that that means there's going to be significantly the job is going to be significantly significantly longer because you can't use hammer drill on steel you have to drill this out with a metal drill fills first and then uh, go with the concrete drill bit and drill that uh, in this um, in the ceiling all right, so that's one thing. The other thing would be something that's called drop anchors. These are wonderful things too. All right, they they work on the expansion. Uh, that's how they uh, that's how they bite into the ceiling structure. They can also look at the specifications. You'll be surprised what they are specified for as far as weight holding. Okay, again. You're only as strong as your weakest point. So if the ceiling structure is the concrete material that's being used is not specified to handle so, so then okay, you know what I mean. All right. The way that these things are being installed, uh you you get hammer drills and sometimes you're going to get heavy duty hammer drills because just a regular one is going to take you too long, it's going you're going to get tired, and you might get actually it might injure some of your muscles or tendons uh, when you do it prolong in a prolonged way kind of thing just mind you because uh you're not sometimes when you're drilling in the ceiling sometimes by the nature of things you're not going to be positioned in the most comfortable way sometimes you're going to have to bend out of shape a little bit just to get into it so get a heavy duty drill so uh so the the drilling of the hole takes as least as possible uh takes at least as possible possible amount of time and effort uh, not because you're lazy but because if you have like three or four hundred of them to do then you're going to look for ways to to make things easier for you for sure guarantee you that all right so um uh, you get the appropriate specified drill bit concrete drill bit drill that thing in and then you get just look at the installation video here uh, you get a little specially made insert and you put that thing in while this thing is inserted, they hit that with a hammer to expand those flaps. Again, what you could do is you can get an insert. You can change the head on the drill bit, on the drill, to have on the hammer drill to accomplish just that. So instead of inserting that thing and punching this thing manually, and you go bang, 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 hit, 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 okay? Or you can just put that in the drill, in the hammer drill, the extension, and you insert that, and it just goes. Whoop, that's it. If you have to have, you have to have. If you have four hundred of them to do, you would choose the quicker and more efficient way for sure. All right. So these are the drop anchor, drop in anchors, and of course you can 
over here you can put uh, bolts that you can make the you can mount the jack hooks in uh, uh, or you can uh, mount the threaded rods inside this thread right here i wish the mouse would not disappear on the uh, powerpoint presentation there you go mr powerpoint who the what's what's the phone number to the powerpoint people yeah okay um all right another way would be chemical another way of mounting things would be something that's called chemical bond uh, it's just well like a strong glue but sticks to metal and concrete and it's uh, for commercial use uh, it's called chemical bond and there are different brands different kinds so look at what's available on, on your local market or maybe what you can order online but just make sure you choose one that you like the best and that is fulfills the specifications again read the specifications on that you'll be surprised uh, as to what weight this thing is specified for right? uh those are quite popular when dealing with center blocks uh and stru hanging structures that uh, can be touched and wiggled out of uh out of way so if you have the expansion uh anchor in concrete and center block the center block is those bricks that uh, you know the side walls in the classrooms uh things can be wiggled out but if you have a chemical bond you have a solid solid bond here this thing it's not moving anywhere uh so um sometimes this is the most uh um most efficient way of mounting those uh, bolts uh, when some heavier stuff needs to hang from there racks uh what else can you do after running wires you're going to have to mount the uh, equipment in something we have racks and we have something that's called 19 inch racks pretty much the racks are specified with 19 inch which is end to end from rack ear to rack ear end of the rack ear to end of the rack ear is 19 inches and they're standardized rack units this PDU, which says Power Distribution Unit, which is a glorified name to name a power bar, <laughs> right? uh, is 1U. It takes one unit uh, for the rack, one rack unit space. Those oscilloscopes that we have in our uh, classroom, <clears throat> just take a look. They're mounted in the rack. Uh, they are 4U. They, they take four rack unit spaces and so on. Racks come in different configurations. You can have wall-mounted racks, uh, open and closed, uh, floor-mounted uh, for floor racks, open, closed, uh, whatever, whatever you you need. Uh, they have a rack for it, and but they're standardized with a 19-inch rack. They come with pre-drilled holes, or what you can see here, those cavities. So it's like an unloaded rail. You get those clips and the rack screws to put in those square openings there and uh, you can put those screws in or sometimes they come in pre-drilled holes there are disadvantages and advantages to both or either all right now here are the dimensions you see here 19 inches right from end to end I get okay and then there are specific uh so three holes is one unit and quite often they are just marked like they're labeled one u one u one u uh those units are being specified in the rack rails they're also being specified in the equipment that you're ordering so when you're designing a system you can tell how many rack units that thing is going to take so you don't cut yourself short when you order the rack so you have to send it back and maybe get a bigger rack or something so you just do it once instead of twice and we mentioned those clips for the rack screws the rack screws can be purchased in uh, electrical supply stores or otherwise installation equipment stores and music stores they will have those too because they use them for um, so you're in a pinch and so you see is there any music store around you know if there's no other distributor they will have those screws because they use it for the musical equipment right the specific type of screws they're called rack screws right and here are the um rails 
unload it and load it pre-drilled thread you just take that scratch screw, screw that in mount the equipment over here you have to get those clips and insert them first right all right so this is the last um, i'm going to leave this thing as the last slide um and as i say always with this with this lesson i'm going to leave this thing open-ended because um this thing never ends right? you have enough background to go about and apply for entry-level position um, as a technician or a technician helper and then you can just escalate from there um, so from now on you have enough background knowledge so as i say enough talking let's just uh, just go and find yourself a job and try to put all the stuff that i gave you in this course try to put it to use right so i'm leaving this thing open-ended and that's it for uh, for this uh, for this lesson here okay i have to press the end of the presentation because i have back-to-back -back class and i'm starting another class in about five minutes okay so i see you when i see you just keep in mind the open labs again the open lab week week 13 and this is for the class of 2023 um, <clears throat> uh, week 13 friday is a good friday so just if you plan to use that time to do your open lab on friday you won't be able to so just just so you know that okay cool and I'll see you when I see you. Thank you, guys. Bye.